for the frail elder waiver, you need to show, and Frank would need to show in this case, that either he can't do two of the, the five things that are listed there by himself, that he needs assistance. Bathing, dressing, eating, toileting, transferring. The first four are obvious. Tra what's transferring? It's getting out of your chair, walking across the room, sitting down again. If you need help with that, even if, if you can get across a room with the walker, but you can't get out of the chair without assistance, then you, you, then you don't meet that ADL. Then that, that, that's one of the two ADLs that could count. If you need help with two of those ADLs, it doesn't have to be by a nurse, just by another human being. Or if you are okay as far as the ADLs are concerned, but you're kind of wandering a lot, you know, your memory's kind of slipping, and there's a little concern you might end up going down 290 by mistake, or 495 by mistake. Well, in that case, you qualify medically for nursing home care. So that's not a real high standard, which means, in this case, that Frank would qualify for the frail elder waiver. The gatekeeper regarding whether you qualify is Elder Services of Worcester Area, Inc., the, the regional entity that provides all these services. And I'm going to answer all questions r right at the end, if you could just write it down or hold that question. Next slide. So suppose that Frank's back home now. So. Everything is, the, the assets have stayed the same, but Mary now owns them all. Um, the income has stayed the same. They still have all of their $36,000 to spend. Um, their real estate taxes, utilities, and insurance, and food have stayed the same. Their fund has gone down a little, we've assumed, because I'm assuming that in addition to all those benefits that, that MassHealth is providing, there are some additional medical costs that are just going to show up, or equipment costs, or whatever. So I'm assuming that Frank's medical expenses have gone up by $9,000. But still, without eating into their savings, Frank and Mary are still at home. And in terms of their goal, live there until you die, get buried in the backyard, everything is still working out OK. And all of their assets have been preserved so that if the both of them die, um, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. can get them. Next slide. What about if Frank couldn't go home? What about if Frank couldn't go home? What about if he broke that hip? And, he will, you know, and, and, it, and the reason why he broke the hip was that he had a minor stroke, and now he's having some minor strokes, and his memory is going, and he really needs to stay in the nursing home. Well, in that case also, Frank could be in the nursing home. Mary could be at home. They could preserve all of their assets. They can preserve all of their assets. And the way that they would do that, remember in the, our example, uh, Frank and Mary owned a house which was worth $400,000. Well, she can have that. Because if there's one spouse in the nursing home and the other one at home, the, the house is not a countable asset. She has $300,000 in cash. Well, she can't have all of that because the rule is that the spouse at home, if there's one in the nursing home, can't have more than $113,560. I think that's the figure. It's a little more than $113,000. But what she could do in that case is she could convert some of that cash into an income stream. Because the mass health rule is that while there are limits on your assets, on the assets of the spouse at home, there are no limits on the income. So you can have infinite <coughs> income. So she could buy an annuity, and as long as that annuity calls for monthly payments over a, peer, over a term which is shorter than her life expectancy, and at this point she's 79 years old, so she has a life expectancy at this point of about eight years, excuse me, 11 years, 11 years at this point, as, as long as, her life, as, long as the, the, the monthly payments are over a term that is shorter than her life expectancy, then her purchase of that annuity is a legitimate conversion from an asset into income. And remember, she can have infinite income. In this situation, if she bought a 10-year annuity with $200,000 today, her monthly payments would be about $1,700 per month. And she'd get those for 10 years. So she could do that. And then, of course, she'd want to change her will again, just as she did in the previous case, because she'd want to make sure that if she died, any of the assets were going to be in trust for Frank's benefit and not go directly to him. 
she'd also make the beneficiary, the death beneficiary of that annuity, be her estate so that that money, too, would pass through the estate into trust for Frank's benefit or after he died to the kids. Okay, next slide. Now, what happens as far, how does that affect her financial situation? Well, now, she, now Frank is in the nursing home. Now, because Frank qualified for Mass Health and is now in the nursing home, his Social Security check has to go to the nursing home. Uh, and Mass Health will pay all the rest, but his Social Security check has to go to the nursing home every month. So her only income from Social Security is her own income, which was the $12,000. However, now she's also getting these annuity checks. She's getting $1,700 a, a month, or about $20,000 a year in annuity. So her total income is now $32,000. Real estate taxes haven't changed, the utilities haven't changed, the insurance haven't cha hasn't changed. We're assuming her food bill went down a little bit because Frank's not there anymore. And, we're, and, she doesn't, and Frank doesn't have any medical expenses because at this point Mass Health is paying everything because he's in the nursing home. So her fund number actually went up. I mean, she's not having a lot of fun because she's spending a lot of time visiting Frank in the nursing home and that's kind of a bummer, you know. But, but to the extent that you know, she, she needed extra money, she's actually got more extra money now. And she's not burning away, well, well, to some extent, she is burning away some of that other money because now she's getting these checks, these annuity checks, which are shrinking the, 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 the asset pile that she had available. But they're going to be there for a long time to provide her with income. So in these situations, even though Frank and Mary had not done any advanced planning, uh, it, it, when this kind of catastrophe hits, they're safe. Next slide. Now, I want to talk about that plan 10 years later. And once again, the, one of the reasons why we developed this presentation was, you know, so often people, you know, you don't live in, you know, you're trying to figure out what happens until you die, because that's the question. How do I live and happy until I die, and then how do I make sure the kids, you know, get taken care of? And so we wanted to kind of play the whole thing out. So assume and this wouldn't be a bad assumption, that during that 10 years, Frank died at some point. The average stay, the, the, I shouldn't say the average, the median stay in a nursing home uh, by all folks over 70 years old is less than two years. So it's likely that during that 10-year period, Frank died. Um, and at that point, at the end of the 10 years, the annuity has run out. She's been living okay. She's lived a happy 10 years. She's still at home. But now she's got to figure out what to do. Next slide. So, so now her income has gone up because remember Frank died, which means she got Frank's Social Security check. So now she's getting $24,000 a year in Social Security. Her assets are down to $100,000. And remember that was the, what she used to buy the annuity, but the annuity has run out. And now here are the expenses. We're assuming that the real estate taxes have gone up because you know she's living in Grafton and even though the selectmen are really paying attention and everything, you know, it's, it happens, taxes go up. And we're figuring the utilities have gone up a little bit, too. Um, that, that the insurance, we're assuming, has stayed the same. We no, should have done up. probably a small. Oh, that went up, too. <coughs> the numbers person tells me that that went up. We're, we're assuming that she's, she's, she's not eating great because her food budget really didn't go up a lot. And she's having no fun. At this point, she's having no fun. She's breaking even. She is just breaking even. She's got the house, and she's got a relatively small pile of assets. And so what does she do? Because remember, her goal is to stay in that house until she dies. Now, if, if that weren't her goal, you know, and she were thinking about shrinking down uh, or going into assisted living or doing a number of other things, then there'd be different plans. But we're assuming that that's her goal. Next slide. That's when she should consider a reverse mortgage. Now, there's a lot of discussion about reverse mortgages, and sometimes they're just a terrible idea. You know, the, 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 as I always tell people, when you're doing a reverse mortgage, kind of figure that it's not really a mortgage, that you're really just selling your house to the bank, but you, and you're getting some money for it, and you're keeping a life estate, right? Because the rules of the reverse mortgage, all, all of the reverse mortgages, there is a state program, but it's tiny. The, any reverse mortgage that you've heard about or would consider is going to be a federally insured mortgage. It's called a HECM, a Home Equity Conversion Mortgage. Uh, the, the only reason why the banks do this is because they're federally insured, because if, if, if you kind of outlive the money that they gave you and what is owed, the federal government pays the bank the difference. Um, so that's, that's why banks will, are willing to do it. So they're federally insured. The payment is based on, on, a, on the amount of the value of the property and also on your age. 
because you know, if, you're, if you're borrowing on a $500,000 house and you're 100 years old, well, geez, they'll give you a lot of money because they figure, you know, because the, the mortgage is going to be due when you die. It's either due at death or one year after you have left the home. So if you end up going to the nursing home, for example, um, the mortgage is due. So you wanna, you'd need to sell the house anyway, but that's what you'd need to do. So, so it's, this is probably when Mary should consider a reverse mortgage. This is one of those rare cases. Next slide. Now, if she were 89, which she is, if her house had gone up in value over those 10 years, which we're assuming from 400,000 to 500,000, she could today qualify for a $375,000 reverse mortgage. It's a substantial, a substantial amount of money. And, and if she, as long as she uses that money, and she could leave that money right in the, in the bank for, and, and, and wait to, re, to withdraw it you know, if, as she needed it, uh, or she could pull it out if she wanted to and she could buy an annuity with it. If she did that, if she bought, I'm just, and once again, there are these different options, but I'm showing you what this path how this path works. If she bought the annuity, as long as that annuity uh, had a term to it, which was shorter than her, life ex her actuarial life expectancy, uh, and so we're making it short, we're making it a five-year annuity. Uh, and as long as she says that upon her death, Mass Health, if she qualified, if she in the meantime went to a nursing home, Mass Health could get, get reimbursed for its money, then that purchase of that annuity would be legitimate as far as Mass Health was concerned, and if she needed nursing home care, she could qualify for Mass Health. Now, the result of all of this is that she would end up with this kind of very, very large payment, this large income payment of $6,250 per month, or about $75,000 per year, um, if, she, if she did the annuity route, which she could use either to have a really good time, I mean, this could be all the fun money, because remember, she was just breaking even before, or she, she could use some of it for fun, and she could save some of it. Next slide. Um, and uh, if, if she needed nursing home care later on, she could take any of the money that she could save, that she had saved, and she could put it into something called a D4C pooled trust, which would keep the money from having to be spent down before she needed nursing home care. So she's going to be in a position where she's not going to need to spend her money down for nursing home care. Next slide. 